hopefully uh, you will still applause after the talk as well. All right. So uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is my first time here as well. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. And my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I like to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that Google and Google Cloud has to offer, uh, both the, the, the cloud and also the open source projects, uh, to developers all over the world. And I love to get your feedback as well so that we can make our projects better and more useful for you. So it is the best that uh, if you can contact me, if you have any feedback at all, uh, find me on Twitter at Satanism. I also work on another project called the Spring Cloud GCP. So if anyone here uses Spring, Spring Boot, uh, we have really, really nice starters that you can try to uh, connect to the, the managed services on Google Cloud as well if you like to try that. I've been in the industry for a very long time. I've done uh, a lot of different things from engineering development uh, to management, management teams and so on and so forth. Uh, but my other passion outside of technology is uh, taking photos. So I love to take photos and you can find some of the places I've been to on my Flickr as well. Okay? So today I'm going to talk um, now the, the theories behind microservices, uh, if you are looking into using a microservices architecture, you should be choosing it for your own reasons that will solve your problem. Uh, don't jump into it without understanding the, the problem domains that you're going to solve and also the complexity that will come with the architecture as well. But one of the things though that the first thing that you will see when you break things down into microservices is that now you have so many more components you have to manage that you have to deploy uh, across uh, many, many more machines that than you ever had done before, right? Rather than running two or 10 instances of a single monolith, you are looking at you know, hundreds of instances of microservices. And you just need to make sure that if this is the architecture for you, you have the right tooling to manage these. Uh, now, with, um, you know, with platform as a service or with containers and uh, things like Kubernetes for orchestration, uh, this is now a more, mostly a trivial task, right? Because we can now deploy hundreds or thousands of these instances across thousands of machines if you really, really need to scale out that way, okay? But there's one thing, though, that I have noticed that most people don't really consider when they are moving into a microservices architecture. And this is by far one of the most important thing, which is how are these services supposed to talk to each other? And I don't know how many people here have went through the service-oriented architecture days. Uh, SOA days, yeah, SOA, yeah. So with SOA, I think we also defaulted to some you know, default uh, 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 protocols or default technology. So for example, in SOA, uh, we used XML extensively to transfer the data between services. And of course, that didn't uh, scale so well because there are some other challenges regarding the, the amount of text you have to send over the wire and also the processing speed of uh, parsing and you know, uh, creating the XML files uh, that you have to send over. But today, we have similar issues potentially, right? Is REST or JSON the right uh, way to talk between services internally, not to the browser, but just from service to another service? And that is the technology that we are mostly defaulting to today, which is you know, text-based JSON over HTTP uh, via REST, for example. Um, so today I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, what we do uh, at Google and also the open source project that you can use to make this communication a little bit more efficient than the default solutions today. And this is by using RPC, Remote Procedural Call. And this is with a project called gRPC. Now, that sounds a little familiar. I don't know how many people here uh, have used RPC before, but this has been around for a long time. Anyone here use Corba? Corba, yeah. Everyone who just raised their hand will probably like want to walk out the room right now, <laughs> right? Because it is quite difficult to do. Uh, but and, and then we had DCOM to interrupt, and then we have RMI potentially for Java, which is uh, actually a little bit nicer. Uh, if you're using RMI because it was designed for Java. All you have to do is to create the interface, you have serialization with your objects, and now you can talk to each other with the RMI server and RMI client, you can just make that call. 
However, uh, RMI is not so interoperable, so if you are using anything but Java, uh, you, you know, outside of Java, then you may not be able to communicate with your services, so that's a little issue. And then, of course, uh, somebody had a good idea to make that data uh, interchange, um, you know, that you can actually talk to uh, between different programs or different languages, and so they decided to use XML, and then they standardized around a, a bunch of uh, protocols with uh, SOAP, basically, and that actually can also be RPC. Why? Because SOAP actually had two different styles. N not many people know about this, but there is the XML uh, document style SOAP, which is more like a RESTful interface today, and then there is the RPC style SOAP, which is allowing you to create your own uh, RPC methods and stuff, right? Uh, just to show you uh, what these, some of these systems look like to, uh, to do a little refresher, with most of the RPC system, uh, what you're going to see is some kind of interface definition language, or ADL. Uh, this actually is a, 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 a slim down language where you can just use to define the data type you need to transfer over the wire, and also the, the operations you can call over the network that your server is able to serve, right? So I found this uh, open source project. It's a, a really nice Corba example, right? So for example, in Corba, you also need to define your data type with the IDL, and then you can define like an interface with uh, different operations on it, right? And you can do all of that, and then most of the RPC framework is going to be able to generate the stops for you. So for example, from Corba, you can generate the server-side stop here, so you just need to extend like a base class, and then you can just implement all of the operations that you're supposed to implement, right? And once you have created this stop, then you have to serve it on a server on a port, and typically you have to write this yourself. Again, this, this is a wonderful example, but this is where Corba kind of breaks down, um, because in order to serve and start a server uh, for Corba, it gets a little bit more complicated, right? So for example, you have things like the orb, the POA, uh, you gotta activate, and then you do all of these referencing, and then I don't even know where uh, it actually starts to serve, right? It actually is a little complicated. And then to make that call, similarly, you have to you know, go through a lot of boilerplate code just to be able to you know, connect to a service. And that is you know, one of the reasons why RPC is not so popular today. Right? And REST and JSON is just so much easier. But there's definitely uh, a place for RPC today, especially with the increase of microservices architecture. Why? Because most of the time, because you define the data type up front and you define the operations up front, you are able to, uh, to basically compile a lot of these things into your program directly. And most of the RPC payload are going to be binary-based rather than text-based, right? So with a binary-based payload, you're going to send a lot fewer bytes than what you would do with the JSON payload, for example. And most importantly, all of these operations are predefined in your IDL. When it generates the code, it also generates strongly typed stops. So you never have to guess if you are sending the, uh, the payload with the right attributes or the right property with the right field name, uh, because otherwise, you know, on the other side, it's not going to be able to pick it up. But with RPC, you're almost always certain you're sending the right type into the right field. Okay? And more importantly, if you're using REST, if you're using strict REST, you are kind of stuck with the CRUD operation that's prescribed by HTTP, which is the, the get, the put, the post, the, you know, the delete. However, this is good if you are operating against a resource that just needs the CRUD operation. What if, what if you need to do a more complicated transaction, a more complicated business operation, like, like taking money from one account and moving it to another account, right? Do you do uh, a, a put on one account and then in transit put on another account via REST and there is no transaction in between? I don't know. But it's, it can be a little bit more complicated. Now you have to manage these transactions differently, right? But if you can make this operation a little bit simpler, you can actually implement a single RPC operation that is called transfer, right? You don't, you're not bounded by the strict REST protocol anymore. But RPC can only be useful if it's simple to use, simpler than Corba, for example, and other uh, RPC protocols and interoperable, so more interoperable than RMI, so you can actually use it across multiple platforms with multiple languages, all right? 
So at Google, we actually use RPC extensively within our data center for our microservices. And we use an internal technology called Stubby. Okay, this is our internal technology that we use for binary RPC. And we are making today 10 to the 10 RPC calls per second. Okay? Now, imagine if we're using REST or if we're using JSON, right? That would be significantly more bytes we have to transfer. Now, just imagine if this protocol uses one extra byte than necessary. That is 10 to the 10 more bytes that we have to send uh, just to support and run our services. And that is significant if we consider that we need to build the infrastructure to support it and so on and so forth, right? So this leads to us to gRPC. So gRPC is the open source version of Stubby. Uh, it was actually worked on collaboratively with, uh, with Google and, and, and Square. And um, basically, we decided to open source this uh, gRPC technology together. Okay? And it is designed to be simple to use and performant. Now, the G in gRPC does not stand for any company I know of. Just saying. <laughs> it, no, actually, no, it's true. The G in gRPC is actually a recursive acronym. So gRPC stands for gRPC Remote Procedural Code Framework, okay? So <laughs> yeah, it does not stand for Google. Uh, this is an open source project that, uh, that uh, you know, that the community owns right now, okay? And it's designed to be interoperable operable as well. It has the concept of an IDL, which is by using protobuffer, okay? Which I will show in a second. And the payload by default also uses protobuffer, uh, protobuffer 3, in fact. And this, again, is a technology that we use internally at Google. And now you can also use it um, in an open source project and in your own project as well. But more importantly, rather than using HTTP 1 or 1.x, which is what most people are using for their RESTful applications, uh, we are actually defaulting gRPC to HTTP 2. Now, how many people here have used HTTP2 before? No, no one, wow. Actually, a lot of you may actually be using HTTP2, you just don't know it, yeah? You just may not know it. But why HTTP2? Well, first of all, uh, HTTP2 is a protocol that's been involved, evolving uh, within Google, actually, prior, uh, known as uh, another protocol that we had. Um, and then it became a standard, with, which is HTTP2. And it solved a lot of the issues with, with HTTP1. Uh, first and foremost, foremost, it is a binary protocol. So in HTTP1, you can actually tell net to the port. I don't know if anyone tried this. You can tell net to the port, and you can just type the text get space slash, uh, and then hit two enters, and then you get back all the text, right? In HTTP2, the get, uh, that's all now a binary uh, bit, basically, right? It's a binary payload. So rather than sending out the get uh, word in three bytes, now we just send a byte to indicate, indicate that this is a get method, and so on and so forth. So HTTP2 is fully binary. Uh, when you send a payload, the payload actually gets chunked up so that uh, it can be sent across multiple streams uh, so that within HTTP2, uh, rather than, say, dealing with a single uh, connection at a time, uh, we can actually multiplex multiple requests and multiple streams on a single connection. This is actually super, super cool. And because we're dealing with streams, HTTP2 actually supports streaming by default, which is like you can stream from server side to the client, so you don't need WebSocket. You can just use HTTP2. You can stream from the client to the server. If you have an IoT device, you can stream from the client to the server. Or you can do uh, bi-directional streaming if you really want to, OK? Which is super bounce nice type here. And then you have the request in the input parameter, right? That's pretty much how everybody writes blocking code. In gRPC, the stop that we generate is non-blocking by default. This is an asynchronous call by default. It is up to the client to decide whether the client needs to block or not, OK? So in this case, I have the, uh, a callback. If you're writing a synchronous code, then you need a callback to send the data back to the caller. And for that, we have a callback called stream observer. Okay. So what we can do, for example, here is to say something like, uh, well, let me go ahead and print out everything in this payload. So I can, I can actually say system out, print, print line, the request. We implement, we generate two string automatically. Okay. 
And then we can use the observer to respond to the client. So I can say on next. So if you look at here, this is really interesting. We have three methods on this callback. We have on next, on error, and on completed. This is actually fully reactive. If you look at the reactive interface, um, or uh, some kind of like Flux or something like that, you're going to see the similar callback here with on next, on completed, on error. Right? It's just that gRPC uh, is using its own re own callback for it. Okay? So we can do something like on next, and I can send back the response. So I'm going to say uh, hello response. Now, again, gRPC loves to use builders, so we need to create a new builder here. And I can set the, the greeting field. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, I'm going to say hello. And I'm going to add the name uh, request.getName. OK, are we done? Almost, almost. If you run your application as this, when the client makes a call, the client will actually hand forever. That is because everything is treated as a stream. We actually have to explicitly close the stream ourselves. Okay? So because this code only sent a payload back, the client will receive it. But we never close the stream. We never finish this request. And so the client will keep on waiting. And this is true even if you define the unary operation uh, in the IDL. Okay, so be very, very careful there. So I'm going to say something like uh, observer uncompleted, I think. There we go. Uncompleted, yeah. And that's it. Okay, and this is how I, imp I can implement a very simple, very straightforward GRP serv gRPC server. And of course, I need to add the service and I need to register it with the server. So I can say something like greeting service info. So I register it to the server. Now, when the server starts, it's going to listen on port 8080. And hopefully everything will work. So let's go ahead and find out. So I'm going to say um, Maven clean pack, uh, install for this matter. And I'm going to say exec Java. Now, how many people think this would just work? Wow, nobody. <laughs> now, now I'm really scared. <laughs> not, not a single person raised their hand. Uh, that, is, uh, that is really scary. huh? Actually, this is supposedly working right now. I'm just tricking you right now. This is working because the server is blocked. I did not print anything out. So, so of course, this works. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> now, we have to test it, right? How do I test this? Well, uh, there are some gRPC CLIs, or the, the things you can use on command line. You cannot use curl, but there are other tools you can use from the command line to test it. But for me, I'm just going to go ahead and write the client, OK? And because the, the stub is generated for me, so everything's pretty simple and straightforward, uh, this is what I'm going to do. First thing I need to know is how do I connect? Where do I connect to to, to do that? I need to create a channel. And how do I create a channel? I use a builder, of course. So I can say I need a channel builder for the target of localhost 8080, because that's where I'm listening on. OK. Uh-oh. Yeah, there we go. Ooh, ooh, what's going on here? Uh, there we go. OK, and because uh, I'm writing in Java, and uh, I don't want to deal with the SSL right now, because that would just take forever. So I'm going to just use plain text, OK? And then um, there are a lot of, of other things I can set in the channel. For example, if you are using something like Eureka or a console or a Zookeeper, you may be storing the list of your services in those systems in the service registry. You can implement the name resolver to figure out what the endpoints are. Okay, so you can implement that yourself. And then, of course, you can load balance on the client side if you want to. You can set up a load balancer factory. And out of the box, we have run Robin load balancer. Okay? But I'm not going to use any of that right now. I'm just going to create a new channel. Okay? Once I have the new channel, uh, then what I can do is to just um, hopefully refer to the greeting service. Again, I'm going to use a generated stop. So I'm going to say gRPC. And then I can just create a stop from here. This is auto-generated for you. There is no uh, messing around with uh, like Swagger or other tools or thing to create your own stop. This is all generated for you. You never have to write your own client library ever again, which is awesome. OK? So remember what I said. Everything on the server side is asynchronous. It's up to the client to decide whether the client wants to block or not. Uh, for this one, I would choose the blocking stop, but you can choose other stop if you want to. You can choose a feature stop, which returns a feature, or just a regular stop, which is fully asynchronous. Okay? So I'm going to create a new stop, and I'm going to just pass in the channel, and that's going to give me a new stop. And I can now just make that call. I'm going to say greet, hello, response, 
Oh, sorry, not a, re uh, just a request. Oh, thank goodness for the uh, type safety here. So I can set my name. I'm going to say Ray. I can set my age, uh, 18. Let's, let's go with that. I can uh, add my uh, hobby. I'm going to say photography. Photography. I'm going to put a uh, bag of tricks. Uh, I'm going to say live coding. Uh, not really good. All right. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the payload I'm going to send to the server. And this is going to give me a response. And of course, I can go ahead and print this out. Print line, the response. All right. And that's it. That should be it for me to implement the client. Let me ask this again. How many people think this would just work? Oh, I'm so sorry to disappoint you in uh, the next few minutes. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for your support. So what I'm going to do is do, I'm going to do another clean uh, package in exec Java just to see this hopefully working. Now, I love Java because if it compiles, it means it's going to run. So this is how you can create a very simple service. Right? Here you can see the payload. And here's the client, which I'd never have to write the, the client library for. Right? This is pretty nice. And you can generate these client stuff for different, uh, for different languages. Right? Now you can have a single service that's really usable by many other platforms without having to write all of those client libraries. That is a very simple example. I took a little long time to explain a lot of the details on what you need to do. But in essence, once you are used to it, you just need to write the IDL, you generate everything, and then you just consume it. You just use it. You distribute the jars where you have the stops, and then everybody can use it. I'm going to try something else now to show you a little bit more things you can do. And for this, I'm going to use um, a string. I'm going to write a little chat application that actually does streaming. Okay? So as you type your chat messages, it's going to stream the message to all of the clients that's connected. And the way I'm going to show it is by using a JavaFX application. So let me just show you what this app looks like. There we go. So essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be able to hopefully create a streaming server for chat in the next 10 minutes or so that's going to allow me to connect to it, say my name, and say hello. And it should, when I hit the send button, it should actually show up. And I should be able to do this with multiple clients as well. Okay. So I'm going to try to attempt this in the next 10 minutes or so. We understand portals already, so this is very straightforward. I defined my message that I need to send to the server. And the message from the server to the client, we just have the timestamp attached to it. OK, very straightforward. I'm going to be able to do bidirectional streaming here. So the client can stream the messages to the server, and the message will be streamed to all of the connected clients. OK, sounds pretty, pretty uh, uh, straightforward, right? Easy, easy. All right. So how do I do this in gRPC? Well, I wrote the proto file. I can generate this stuff, and this is the method I need to implement. Okay. And again, you gotta be careful. You gotta understand what's actually generated and how this actually works. If you look at the signature right now, you might be a little confused because I was uh, when I first tried this out. Because if you look at here, the stream observer in the request parameter is actually what I need to send back to the client, back to the caller. And to get messages from the client, I actually have to return something to them. So it is opposite of what you would otherwise expect, right? Usually, what the client sent to you will be in the request parameter, parameter and what you send to the client will be on the response. But that's not the case here. This is, again, because this is fully asynchronous. Okay, it will make a lot of sense, uh, hopefully, after I am finished with this, right? So first of all, we're going to record all the connected client right now. So I'm going to add all the response observers. That's the client listening to my, my, my messages. I'm going to add all the client into, um, into a list, OK? And then to get a message from the client, because this is asynchronous, I need to send back the client a little callback. And this is where I need to return a new stream observer here, OK? And what this is actually doing is to almost like sending the client a reference, but we're not doing anything with the references here. But this, programmatically speaking, this is a callback where when the client sends me the message, it will just call this callback here with on next. So what am I going to do here when I receive a message from a connecting client? Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, first of all, change this to a message from server. I'm going to use the new builder. I'm going to say build. I'm going to set the, the message here with the message that I just received. And optionally, I can set the timestamp, but I don't have time for that, so that's OK. 
All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce a, oh, where, where did it go? Well, shoot, there we go. Introduce a local variable, there we go. Okay, and this is gonna be the message, okay? And then for all of the connected client, I need to, for every one of them, ooh, okay, that's fine, I guess I can deal with that. I'm going to send back the message to them, so I'm going to send on next to, to them, and that's it. That's how I can just stream data back to the client. Every time I re-see something, I'm gonna propagate it to every connected client. Uh, if the exact Java, oh, what do I do? So there's a reason why I keep this to the last minute. Because if it doesn't work, I just say, oh, sorry, the time is up, right? And I like, see you. <laughs> so we will find out very, very quickly, okay? And here is the, the Java FX application. I'm not gonna go into the details here, but the more important thing here is that uh, I have the channel, I have the stub, I can actually make this call. I'm going to say chat. I'm going to send in a stream observer, okay? And remember what this observer will actually do. Uh, this will listen to the messages from the server. So every time I get a new message from the server, well, guess what? I'm going to add it to my list of messages so that I can display it. So I'm going to say value.getMessage.getFrom, uh, and then that, so that's the name of the person who sent it, plus the value.getMessage.getMessage. And that's just the way I structure my application, my payload, okay? And because I'm in JavaFX, I need to do something special here with the run later so I can uh, display in the UI thread rather than in the background thread, okay? So that should be it, let me make sure. Oh, I'm missing the semicolon here, okay? So every time I receive a message from the server, I will display it on my text box. Uh, here with the arrow, I'm really not gonna do anything today. Uh, so I'm gonna do nothing and do nothing, okay? And this, of course, will return to me another observer. Whew. And this is the callback that I can use to send data to the server. Now you get it? So even though on the server side I'm returning a callback, uh, effectively the callback is here. Again, there's no memory references here. It's just a way for us to abstract away the complexity behind the scenes. Uh, it's just a way for us to deal with these, uh, the, the streams in gRPC, okay? So what do I need to do? When I say send, when I click on the send button, it's going to issue an action. And in this action, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send the data to the, to the server, so I'm gonna say observer on next. And for this one, I need to send in a chat message. So I'm going to say new builder.build. Oh, builders, there we go. And then I can say from, so who is the message from, and I think that's uh, the field called name. I'm going to say get text. And then finally, the message I wanna send, and that's stored in the message text box, I'm going to say get text. All right, so I think that's it. I, I think that's all I have to do, okay? Get message from the server, display it, and then whenever I click on that little button, send it to the server, and this is all done via gRPC with HTTP2 with bidirectional streaming, okay? So let's give it a try. How many people think this will work? Well, so just so you know, the number of hands went down a little bit. <laughs> so I'm not building so much confidence. I hope that's because this is either uh, mind-blowing or it actually just don't work, okay? So, so here we go, so this is my text box. I'm going to say Ray, hello. Oh, okay, so I'm getting something back, okay? This is not bad, this is not bad. I'm getting something back, but we can only be sure if I can do this with two different clients. So I'm going to run another one here with Maven Java, uh, Java JFX run. Oh, now I'm really, really scared, okay? So, so here we go, I got two things. Uh, and this is a uh, make it or break it time, so I'm going to use my boss, uh, his name is Greg. I'm gonna say, did it work? Okay, so if it works, it should show up in both sides, and it does, well, not bad. Yeah, thank you, Phew. it works. And I, I don't get to talk to Greg a lot, I'm just gonna pretend to be him and say, uh, good job, Ray. <laughs> I'm gonna say something, usually I end up saying like, do I get a race, you know? And he'll probably say, uh, no, but you get to keep your job. Okay, and I can do this all day, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Whew, that was close. <laughs> and there's a lot more, there's a lot more to it, of course, there's a lot, a lot more things you can do. I'm gonna go back to the slide a little bit. Ooh. So you can, you can use client-side load balancers if you like. Okay, uh, or you can use uh, server-side load balancer with uh, potentially NGINX. 
Uh, Envoy is a very popular load balancer right now that you can use in a service mesh. Uh, Linkerd works as well, so you can load balance your RPC call very easily. Uh, if you want to integrate with a service, uh, a service registry, you can do that too. You just have to write your own name resolver. But most importantly, uh, in a microservices fashion, like our architecture, what you need is observability into how well your service is doing. For that, you need distributed tracing. You can do that with uh, Brave or Zipkin uh, to trace your service to service call automatically. Or you can use something like Open Senses, which is another open source project that Google has created. You can monitor your application with, for metrics with Prometheus. Again, there's like dropping interceptors you can use to just intercept and record all the metrics. Uh, and finally, a lot of people ask, well, how do you actually use um, a REST? How do you consume it from the website? Well, the browser does not support gRPC. And to do that, you need some kind of transcoding between REST and gRPC payload. And there are some open source projects out there that does it, like gRPC Gateway. But if you're on the cloud, if you use the Google Cloud Platform, for example, we have this transcoding building for you so that uh, if you run a gRPC service on the cloud, we can automatically transcode uh, based on the, the protofile definition. We can transcode from REST or JSON payload to the gRPC payload for you, which is really neat. Okay? And there's one more thing. Let me see here. And this is actually quite important. You can add additional behaviors to the stub if you like. So for example, this is super useful. If you're making a gRPC call to a, one service, that service calls another one, that service calls another one, or that um, you have a, 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 a thing out situation where you have, you're making like 20 different calls, but you don't care if all of them respond because you just don't know, you, you don't care about that much data. What we can do is to actually add a deadline to the call. So I can say, when I call this service, you, this service will have a deadline of two seconds. And that service took 20 milliseconds to finish. Uh, however, uh, it makes another call to another service, then that second service will only have uh, 980 milliseconds to finish, right? The deadline will be propagated downstream to the nested service to service calls. This is super, super useful. If you exceed the deadline, then the calls will be canceled, cascading down for the entire service chain, okay? So if you ever need to cancel a call, when you cancel the top level call, you actually get cascaded down to all of the other call that this particular service made calls to. Okay, so we can actually add a deadline very easily. So for example, I can say stop dot with deadline after, okay? And then um, I can probably do, let me see here, what is the, ah, oh, there we go. I can give it the duration, so maybe one, okay? And then give it a time unit. Ooh, that's not English there. <laughs> Let me switch back to you, right? So you can give it to a time unit. So for example, if your service is really, really performant, you can say, I need a deadline for one day, right? So, so this call will time out after one day, basically. Right? No, but typically you don't do that. You do you know, like milliseconds or microseconds or stuff like that, okay? And again, this will be assigned to a stop. And now this call, the first call here, uh, will actually be, uh, uh, have this deadline applied, and if it took more than one millisecond, then the call will be canceled. This is super useful in a more sophisticated microservices architecture, okay? Now, finally, the reason I'm here is because gRPC is open source, and we would love everybody to contribute, to provide feedback. So if you can uh, c you know, join the forum, you can find my talk, you can find the, the source code on GitHub, and uh, find us on, on the groups. And uh, if you have any question, uh, find me on Twitter. And thank you very much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And just for completeness, I do have my own website that you can go and you can find this talk and all the material there. Okay, very cool. Whew. So if you have any questions, I think I will be outside because I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs>